In this video, we're going to talk about the Stackelberg um, model of uh, oligopoly. And the Stackelberg model is really just like the Cournot model with only one difference. And, and that difference is that the firms don't move at the same time. So that fir one firm uh, moves first and uh, the other firm uh, moves after that. And so this is often called a leader follower model because there'll be one firm who is the leader who chooses output in the first period. And then the other firm is the follower who chooses it in the second period. And we're going to stick with the duopoly case where there's only two firms, but it can be extended to, you know, three, four, five, six firms, you know, to be a little bit more realistic. And so this is uh, sort of perhaps most relevant when there is a dominant firm within an industry. So, you know, the examples are, you know, General Motors in the 1960s, Anheuser-Busch in the beer industry. And... Um, the announcements um, will often be, oh, we're producing, you know, we expect to produce this many cars in, uh, you know, the first quarter. Um, and, you know, those uh, those announcements often serve more than one purpose, right? They'll often be made in um, in the context of, say, a, you know, a stockholders meeting or an analyst report. Um, but they're also a signal to the other firms. Um, and so that's what we're going to solve here in the Stackelberg model. And because it's uh, a model with more than one period, we have to solve it backwards, right? Um, we can think of it not as a, a normal form game, but um, as uh, a, fir a, a game where, you know, firm one goes, then firm two goes. So we've got two firms. They're choosing output. Uh, just like Cournot, firm one chooses output in the first period, firm two chooses output in the second period. Um, profits are the same as they were in Cournot, right? So it's just A minus B times big Q, which is uh, QI plus QJ times QI. So that's total revenue uh, minus CQI. So AQI minus BQI squared minus BQI QJ minus CQI is the profit. Information is perfect and complete. Um, the only difference is, is this timing, right? And so in period two, uh, firms, firm two's problem is pretty simple, right? They're going to produce however much is profit maximizing, given how much firm one said they're going to produce, right? And that's going to generate Nash equilibrium values for firm, uh, for both firms. Now, firm one has to think, all right, well, how much do I want to announce I'm going to produce in firm one to maximize my profits? given that I know firm two will take that amount into consideration um, when they decide how much they are going to produce. So firm one has to solve firm two's profit maximization function and then plug it in to their profit maximization functions, right? So we already have firm two's best response function. We solve for that in Corno, And that best response function gives how much they're going to produce for any level of Q1, right? It's going to be A minus C over 2B minus one half Q1. And so firm one says, all right, that's how much you're going to produce. So I can say, all right, I know my profit function because my price depends on uh, how much you produce. I can plug that in to my profit function. And now because you Q1 is in your best response, now my profit is only in terms of Q1. So I get A minus B Q1 minus C over 2 times Q1. And then I take the derivative of that, right? And that we just have a, a Q1 squared in there. So that becomes the 2. And we get A minus 2 B Q1 minus C over 2 equals 0. Um, this should look pretty familiar, right? The only difference between this and the monopoly uh, first order condition is, is the 2 in the denominator. So we can solve that. Um, for Q1 star, and then just plug that in to Q2's best response function to get uh, Q2 star. Um, and so what we get is A minus C over 2B uh, for Q1 star, and then A minus C over 4B for Q2 star. Now remember, again, we have the same price. We still are selling homogeneous goods, and so we can't have different prices. We add up Q1 star and Q2 star to get market output, uh, capital Q star, plug that into the inverse um, demand curve to get P star, we get A plus 3C over 4. And then, but profits are going to be different 
because they're producing different amounts. And so in this case, um, pi one star is a minus c over two over eight b and pi two star is a minus c over uh, squared over 16 b, excuse me, a minus c squared over eight b. Um, and so firm one is earning higher profits because they are producing more. And so in this case, there is a first mover advantage, right? There's an incentive for GM in the 1960s to say, hey, this is how many cars I'm producing in you know, Q1, because then you know, Ford uh, and, and Chrysler say, okay, well then I guess that means I'll produce this much in order to maximize my profits, right? So there is that first mover advantage. That's not always going to be true. Um, and if you, you can do a similar game with Bertrand, um, obviously with differentiated products, because with, with the same products, you just get price equals marginal cost. But in that case, you want to move second um, rather than first. So if we think about, you know, the Stackelberg equilibrium, um, the Cournot equilibrium is here at B where we're producing the same amount, right? The Stackelberg equilibrium is here at A, where firm one produces more and firm two produces less. Um, note that we can we could still get to the sort of monopoly output, and if we had collusion, we might still get um, higher profits. Um, but um, as long as there's no collusion, you know, firm one has this incentive to commit to producing this amount, and it's really about that commitment that gives firm one. Uh, the higher profits in this case, right? As long as they're able to commit to that higher level and firm two believes them, uh, then firm two will end up producing less than they would uh, in Cournot, right? They're, they produce at Q2 star rather than at this higher level here. So in Stackelberg, there is a first mover advantage, but that's not always the case.